Part of becoming a professional programmer in an object-oriented programming language is learning how to think about objects. And there are three pillars to object-oriented programming that every beginner needs to learn. And it's a leap for a lot of people. And frankly, I've always felt like the standard examples of like shape, circle, square, and vehicle, car, truck, not only are overused, but they're not really tied to actual software development projects that you would see on the job. So in this video, I'm going to break down three of the pillars of object-oriented programming and try to provide a little bit more color and some real world examples to how these pillars impact your ability to design software. But before we jump into the pillars, we should talk about what an object actually is. And objects are just organizational structures for your code, and they organize data and behaviors. So for example, if we were talking about a dog object, it might have data like breed, color, height, weight, and name. And it might also have behaviors like eat, sleep, bark, and poo. Now the whole point of these pillars is to take these objects and design them in a way that makes them reusable, extensible, and more maintainable. And the first pillar I want to talk about is encapsulation. Now, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as data hiding. And the concept here is that some members, the data and behavior of your objects are public, which means anybody can see them, anybody can invoke them, anybody can make changes to them. Other members can be private, which means they're hidden. And when you have a well-designed object, you only make the things public that other code needs to interact with. And a good example of this in the real world is your car. When you get into your car and you start the ignition, there is a whole bunch of stuff that's happening behind the scenes. There's spark plugs firing, you know, engines are turning on, you've got computer systems initializing, brake systems and all that stuff. You have no idea what order things are happening in or what they're actually doing. All you know is that when you start the car, it should start and be ready to go those steps are hidden from you, they're encapsulated. And in the same way in the real world, I always like to use the example of a bank account object. Now, if you make everything public on a bank account, including the balance, that means any other code is gonna be able to change the balance and do whatever they want. You don't want that to happen. So you'll hide data like the balance and then you'll expose public methods to allow people to make changes like deposit or withdraw. And in that withdraw method or that deposit method, you're going to code in rules and checks. Like they might not be able to withdraw more than the balance. They might not be able to withdraw if they have a block on their account. They may not be able to deposit more than a certain amount of money every day. And you can't enforce those rules if the balance is just public and anybody can change it because then people can go around it. So a well-designed object only shows the things that you want other people to interact with. Another way you commonly see encapsulation used is to enforce the order of processes. For example, if we have an online shopping cart, there are a lot of things that happen when you actually check out. It needs to charge your credit card or payment it needs to notify the warehouse, set up the shipping, and send you a receipt via email. If any of those steps is called out of order, that would be a bad thing. And if you made all of that information public, somebody else could actually call those things out of order. So usually what you'll do is you'll create a public checkout method and then have a bunch of private supporting methods that do the processes in the order they should be done as well as handle logic for if any of those steps fail. And this is basically the entire concept of encapsulation. You should only expose the minimum amount that other code needs to get its job done. Another good example of this, when you first start programming, you might use console.log if you're in JavaScript or console.writeline if you're in C-sharp or print if you're in Python. Those things print out text. You don't care how that text gets there. Is it using a byte stream? How is it finding the terminal window? We don't know, we don't care. It's a small public method. You pass data in, the magic happens. That's a great encapsulated interface. Now the next pillar of object-oriented programming is inheritance. Now inheritance has kind of fallen out of favor in the last 
10 years or so of object-oriented programming because it is kind of limiting and it can lead you to some bad design decisions. But it is still used and it's still good in specific situations. And one of the most common places you see inheritance is in gaming code. Now let me give you an example because I used to code for an online game. We had a class called Living. And Living had all of the health points for a living object. And as those health points approach zero, when they hit zero, it would invoke a died method and stuff would happen. Either it would die and items would drop, or if it was a player, they might be sent back to respawn. But all objects that were living inherited from that one living class. So you got to reuse all that health point, regeneration, and death method logic across any living creature. And that's all inheritance is. You're going to define something and you're going to inherit parts of that to your children. And this is a really easy way to reuse code. Another example from the Skill Foundry course, we actually show you how to create a role-playing game inventory class. Because if you think about it, when you play a game, there's a whole bunch of different containers. You have backpacks, you have objects in the real world like treasure chests, but the whole concept of these objects is that they have a capacity and they can store one to many items in them. And how you put items in and remove items is the same pretty much for every type of object in that world. So by inheriting a container class into specific things like backpacks and wardrobes and treasure chests is a really good code reuse technique. And this brings us to the last and probably most complicated object-oriented pillar, polymorphism. But I'm gonna to try to simplify this for you. Polymorphism is just about switching out one object for another that are compatible. Now, when you're programming in a language like C-sharp or Java, the type of the object is very strict. So going back to our video game reference, if we have a player character and they have a weapon, you might have classes for sword, axe, staff, and those are very specific things. You can't put a sword object in a staff variable. They have to match. So one of the things object-oriented programmers do is they create something called an interface, or you can do it with inheritance, but it's more common to do it with interfaces, and that interface is applied to all of those objects. So going back to our weapon example, we might have an interface where we define a method called attack. And if we attach that interface to each of those weapons, sword, axe, staff, all of them will be able to attack. In fact, they're required when you add an interface to have that attack method. Now on the player side, instead of creating variables for every type of weapon in the game, you would instead create one variable of that interface type. And because of polymorphism, you could then store any type of weapon that implements that interface in that variable. So now all of a sudden from the player code perspective, it just has an interface for a weapon. It doesn't care if it's a sword or a staff or an ax, but it knows that whatever it's holding, it can call the attack method. And that's how that works. Now in the real world, a good example of an interface is a power outlet. As long as your device implements the power outlet interface, it has the proper plug, it will get power and you can use that object. Another example is universal remotes. You have the remote control that comes with your TV or your stereo. There are other remotes that are off brand that can be swapped out for the remote that came with your TV because your TV declares an interface and any device that implements that interface can interact with your TV. And this is the same thing that's going on in your code. And of any of the pillars, polymorphism is the one that's going to come up most often in the interview because polymorphism is the key to professional developer techniques like dependency injection, which is frequently used for unit testing as well as component swapping in your applications. And if you need to practice on polymorphism, you know, I'm gonna self-promote here and talk about Skill Foundry because we go into that deeply. There's a lot of examples and a lot of practice projects, and I guarantee you by the end of the Skill Foundry course, you will understand polymorphism at a deep level.
So I hope that this helped you better understand the three pillars of object-oriented programming. As with any technical concept, this just takes a lot of practice and application before it really settles in. But if you have other metaphors or examples that have helped you understand these concepts, leave them in the comments below because other viewers will really appreciate the conversation. Happy coding.